Hello and welcome. I'm Pastor Bobby, lead pastor of Community Fellowship Church here in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Um, it's our hope that this talk is going to be an encouragement for you on your spiritual journey. We do believe that you can have a spiritual connection with God, a personal connection, and that Jesus is your link to that. It's actually our goal for um, people at CFC to become committed followers of Christ. And we think these online talks are a great resource for you, but not a replacement for being part of a local community, a church. And so we want to encourage you to be plugged into a church somewhere where you are. But if you're ever in Lancaster, we'd love for you to come and visit us in person at some point. And you're welcome to check out more on our church at our website, communityfellowship.com. Um, hopefully this talk can be inspiring for you. We hope that you can enjoy it today. If you're visiting, I'm Bobby, by the way, and, and this is about Jesus. We're not about a religion here. We're about the idea that God came on a rescue mission to set you free. You can know him, and I would challenge you, if you haven't, to accept him as your personal savior uh, and, and to, to learn to be in a relationship with him, not in a religion, all right? Um, we, we have been, if you've accepted Jesus, we've been incredibly blessed. God um, loves us. He has forgiven us. Uh, and CFC, um, our future is amazing. It's amazing what God has prepared for us and for our future. We've been so blessed, and we've been um, blessed to the point that we are vessels to be able to bless other people. And in August, we're going to go into these blessed practices, which are really not a, another thing to do. It's a description of what a Christian does who's felt blessed of God. It's just an overflow. And so we're, we're excited to walk through that. We're in Psalms, so two Psalms that we're covering about what does it mean to be blessed. Um, last week we were in Psalm chapter 1, and it was the imagery of um, a tree and the idea of agriculture and where you're planted. You will be blessed based on where you've chosen to be planted. Some are planted in the counsel of the wicked or crookedness, and others are planted and choose to be planted in a relationship with God, and they meditate on the words of God. Today we're going to talk about um, the idea of being blessed from a warfare perspective, all right? And so um, we're going to talk about the captain of our salvation, and if you've accepted Christ, then you're blessed because he's fighting your battles for you, CFC. He's fighting your battles for you, and we're going to spend time in that. Psalm 144, 15, actually the psalm ends um, this way. Blessed are the people whose God is the Lord. If you've made God the Lord, then you are happy, satisfied, blessed, and it's beautiful to be able to um, say, hey, he has blessed me so richly, I'll never get over what he has done for me. So recently our students went to Harlem, in, in New York, and um, they were able to just bless uh, people in the city. They were helping with kids camp, and there were all kinds of different things that they were doing. One of the things was hot dogs, free hot dogs. So uh, out on the street, you had them lined up, and one of our um, leaders there, his name's Carlton. He's been um, volunteering in student ministry for, I think, 67 years now or so. <laughs> but is that you, Carlton? He's right here. Hey, a shout out for Carlton. Yeah. <laughs> I, I heard this story. I hope it's correct. But so Carlton is like, uh, has got the sign out there, um, free hot dogs, you know, uh, free prayers. And uh, this car pulls up. Guy rolls down the window and says, you ready? You ready? Let's do this. So he, he's thinking he's, he's about ready to, you know, lose his life or whatever. And, and <laughs> do what? So the guy jumps out of the car. Well, pray, right? Pray for my mother. Pray for my brother. So he's like. They're, they're getting into it, and, like, w we've been made to just bless people. Like, w if you know God, then God will open up opportunities, and you can bless them. But if we're honest, sometimes we're wrestling with fear or with disappointment, and uh, we don't always feel um, like blessing others. Sometimes we don't feel like we're blessed. And today, as we walk through this psalm, I, I would love for it to be a reminder for you that you're incredibly blessed because you have uh, the captain of your salvation, and he's fighting for you, all right? He's fighting for you. So this is a little bit of um, some of the, the language that is used. David is a warrior king. Uh, he was an elite soldier, um, and he um, uses battle language in here for the sake of peace and prosperity in the nation. 
um, we want to be okay, right? And so as the attacks come, we want to um, know what it means to be blessed and protected by God. We know that Jesus is the ultimate warrior king, and uh, he's, he was known as the son of David, the son of God, the son of man, and uh, incredibly powerful, came down as a connection from heaven to earth. And Hebrews 2 describes him as the captain of our salvation. He is the one who has authored your salvation. If you've accepted Christ, he, he's the one behind it and has revealed himself to you. Um, he is the perfecter. He's going to perfect what concerns you. He is the one who's taking the lead. He is your chief leader. And you can rest in the fact that he's your, the captain of your salvation. So let's get into the psalm. It starts with the word bless, the Hebrew word in this case, when you're blessing God, the root word is to kneel. Um, it's an, an act of worship. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bow and kneel before you, God, and worship you. And I'm going to bless you, God, because you are my rock. You are my rock. That word um, in the Hebrew language, tzur, is, is um, the idea of an absolute construct. In the fluidity of life, CFC, you are not going to experience the covenant love of God from anyone else like you would here. It's, it's, it's out of this world. It's unusual. It's not what you're going to experience. You're going to experience people will come and go. People will judge you a certain way. People will be in and out of relationships. You're going to experience differing, changing job situations. You're going to experience fluidity. There's going to be change in your life. But this is an absolute construct. And he's saying um, this is... You do this for me. In the Hebrew language, um, we're going to go through all kinds of description of God being my rock in this passage that end with the letter E in Hebrew, which means my. You are my absolute construct. Not just a concept, but I've experienced this and I continue to experience you are my rock. Okay? He goes in and he says, you're the one who has actually trained my hands for war. I've been tested, and I've learned to trust you in the process. You've trained my hands for war in preparation. And so, when you read in 1 Samuel chapter 17, I don't, I don't know if some of you um, realize this about David, but David is about to go up against Goliath, the largest battle in his life. And Saul stops him and says, David, dude, like you, you need some added armor. You need a bigger sword. You, you need to be ready. And so, so David stops him and says, Saul, I've been trained to do this. I used to be a shepherd, and, and when a lion would come and take a sheep, you can read this, um, I would actually run after the lion and, and grab it, and it would drop that sheep. And then the lion would turn and come at me, and I would, I would catch him by his beard, yank him down, and stab him in the side of the head. Whoa! Uh, it, go to the Philly Zoo, tr guys, and try this. So, <laughs> so here comes the lion, and you, and you try to nail him, and what happens? Well, you know what happens. That paw is coming, right? He's about ready to knock your head off. But then David describes to Saul of why he's prepared for this battle. Because he says, not only do I grab him by the beard, but then I've seen God deliver me from the paw of the lion. What does that mean? David is saying, I've learned to fight these battles with me and God, with us together. So I've stepped in in faith and done my part, and then God supernaturally comes in and delivers me. I've learned to make him my refuge. And we're doing this together. Now some of us, the, the spiritual warfare that you're in is described that the devil prowls like a roaring lion. He's seeking someone to devour. And 1 Peter 5, 9 then goes on to say, you need to resist him standing firm in your faith. That word resist, when we talk about God being our refuge, right, to resist means that I'm going to make, I'm going to, st I'm going to stay under the umbrella of protection and it's not going to be me fighting the lion. 
it's me in tandem with God, stepping under that umbrella of protection. He's my refuge. And as the attack comes, this is where I'm going to be. And I'm going to be safe. I'm going to be protected. He's going to deliver me from that fatal blow. That's where I'm going. If I step out over here and don't make God my refuge, you're going to get wet if you step out into the rain, right? And he had somehow learned to make God his refuge. And he's like, it's going to be me and God together. And we're going to do that in tandem. And so I'm going to go out and fight Goliath. I'm going to do this. So he goes into a five-fold description in verse 2 of what it means for God to personally be his rock. My absolute construct. He starts with the Hebrew word chesed e, meaning my loyal love. God, you are my loyal love. In relationship, when I've failed people along the way, then people will turn their back on me. But God, you are my loyal love. In fact, in 1 John 2, it says, if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins. And he's reminding us that when you're in Christ, you have an advocate, a helper, an aid to come alongside you and to stand with you even in the midst of failure. And then he says, he is our propitiation, meaning an offering that has appeased the wrath of God. So how can I stand here in protection from the accusations of the devil, from this prowling lion who just wants to destroy me? Is the, the wrath of God has been appeased, and I stand here under this umbrella of protection. I've chosen to stay here. And so God, you are my steadfast love. That's an absolute construct. You're my fortress. The fastness of me amid large-scale attack. The, the Hebrew word for fortress, right, would, would ring a bell with the average Hebrew listener. And they would think of Masada, an incredible fortress in the wilderness in southern Judea. So um, the fastness of me amid large-scale attack. So what is the imagery here? You have Masada, you have four or five hundred zealots with their families, you have Jerusalem destroyed in 70 AD by Titus, and they flee to Masada, and then you have the general who sends one battalion after the next. That's 8,000 total. So eight battalions of trained professional Roman killers are sent to Masada to destroy that final holdout. And if you ever visit over there, there's a, a snake path, a trail that goes up to Masada, and it's narrow. And it uh, takes about 75 minutes or so to walk up there. And they, they easily were able to beat these eight battalions back with rocks and bow and arrow. All right? So what telling us in this is that as a fortress, you will not be overwhelmed by the powers of evil. You will not be overwhelmed. It's going to be limited amidst large-scale attack. It's going to be limited, and you will not be overwhelmed by them. My stronghold is the idea of the impenetrable tower, and this is my stronghold. You are the tower to which I run. I can climb up into the tower, and I have a vantage point of protection as I run to this tower. You're my deliverer. You're, you're a place of escape. If the enemy could bust into this tower, if there were a way for the enemy to get there, if there were a way for me to be it, cornered in that final place where I'm going to receive that fatal blow, then God will give me wings and deliver me in that moment. That's who you are. You are my deliverer. 1 Corinthians 10, God is faithful. He won't let you be pressed beyond your ability. With every temptation, he will provide a way for you to escape. The deliverer so that you can stand up under it. And then I love his fifth description. Very personal again. My magini, my shield of faith against the attack of the accuser. Where the, the, the spiritual attack comes at you. Satan will begin to tell you that you're a loser. Why do you even try 
Why should you even go to church or be in a community group? Why should you even read the scriptures? You're a loser. Not just a one-time loser, a loser. And he's going to try to attach not just guilt, but shame so that that becomes your identity. And then you're able to say, no, God, you are my shield. 1 John 5, everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. What? How great you're able to fight? Just your faith. You've put your faith in the living God. You've put your faith in Jesus Christ and what he did for you on the cross. And that is your shield. That is your protection against the fiery arrows of the enemy. And so God, you are this to me personally. You are this to me personally. So Saul comes up to David, and he's contemplating. He said, all right, David, I guess God has trained you. You're fighting with God, but take this armor and put it on. Take this sword, and it's so big and clumsy. And David tries and says, no, I'm just going to take a sling, my sling. And everybody's eyebrows just go, whoa. Is he kidding me right now? So he steps out in front of Goliath, and Goliath looks down at him. You're an idiot. You stupid idiot. I've killed people bigger than you. I've killed thousands of people. I'm going to grab you by your ankles and smack your head against a rock. And he's just yelling at him, ridiculing him, screaming him. And David steps back and says, you come to me with sword and javelin. I come to you in the name of the living God. The, the God of heaven's armies. And then he slings his sling, that rock hits Goliath, he falls to the ground and cuts off his head. You, God, are my deliverer, and you have actually trained my hands for war. I'm not in this. I don't measure myself into the future based on my own strength. I look at the captain of my salvation, and so it's not me against the devil. It's me and God against the devil. And I'm going to stay under this place of refuge, and we're going to do this together. The captain of my salvation in whom I take refuge. I take refuge in him. And so that's where we go in in verse 2b. um, He in whom I take refuge. Now, I thought it was interesting um, that when you get to verse 10 in this passage, just to jump ahead a little bit, there's a promise there that he gives victory to kings, right? He gives victory to kings. And so I started to think, well, wait a second. Is that really true? I mean, that... Sometimes in the Bible, um, there's, there's a, a general, I mean, this is who God is and what he does. But is this really true? Did he give victory? What about Saul? I started to think of Saul, right? And then as I, I was thinking about this, I started to realize that um, David and Saul were both kings, and they were both anointed and given God's spirit in order to lead the nation as warrior kings for peace and prosperity. So they both were there. But what was the difference? What happened? And I believe the, the telltale sign here is that over a lifetime, David had shown himself to take refuge in God, and Saul did not. Over a lifetime, Saul chose not to take refuge in God. He was a people pleaser. He... He would, he would rely on his own strength. And then towards the end, he would go even towards witchcraft. And he wasn't making it a lifestyle for God to be his refuge. 1 Samuel 15 actually says, when Samuel confronts Saul and says, the kingdom was going to be taken from you, it says, Saul had turned back from following God. He, he did not make God his refuge. He didn't, he didn't live in that place of power and victory because when it came down to it, he went and was allowing other things to be his refuge. He did not make God his refuge. David did, and the Bible says, as a result, God subdued people under him. In you I've taken refuge, the one who subdues people under me. And God did that for him. 
And then David goes on to describe the one to whom I go where he, he says, O Lord, what is man that you regard him or the son of man that you think of him? Man is like a breath. His days are like a passing shadow. He, he, he was overcome with the fact that God would pay attention to him. Remember when he wrote Psalm 139? I can't believe how vast is the sum of your thoughts for me, God. More than the grains of sand. What, how can it be that you think of me so much, God? I'm overwhelmed with that. Someone told me recently that they're so deeply disappointed in God when they thought, this is, this is going to be the outcome, and then it didn't happen, and I trusted you, God. How can I ever trust you again? I, can, I can't go back to worshiping you. You say you're my refuge, but you haven't shown yourself. And I'm just saying, CFC, it's by faith. There's a timing involved. And this is the power that God never stops thinking about you. And he's at work even when you don't see what he's doing in a particular slice of time. Do, do you understand, CFC, that the, the, what is the opposite of love? Is it anger? No. Anger is a form of love. It's because you still care. The opposite of love is hatred. And the highest form of hatred is indifference. For God to say, I don't even care about you anymore. Never. Who am I that you are mindful of me? I'll never get over the fact, God, that you think of me. I will worship you. You are my refuge. And David did that. Let's keep going, verse 5. This is now where we're getting into um, superhero kind of language, right? Bow your heavens, O Lord, and come down. Touch the mountains so that they smoke. Flash forth the lightning and scatter them. Send out your arrows and rout them. Stretch out your hand from on high. Rescue me and deliver me from the many waters, from the hand of foreigners whose mouth speak lies and whose right hand is a right hand of falsehood. And I love the action words here where God is... is is being called to action. God, would you do the supernatural? Would you do what only you can do? Would you work powerfully? I'm making you my refuge. I need you to come through. I love that there are nuances in this text of the first coming of Christ when he touched down on the earth. The, the heavens bowed and the incarnation of God enters our world and becomes one of us and we can relate. We can connect with him. And then the nuances of the second coming when God is going to touch down in Zechariah 14 on the Mount of Olives and is going to split that mountain in two. And he's going to shake the world and, and uh, intervene on our behalf. In the final moment, God is going to touch down. I thought it was fascinating thinking about the end, how um, the UN recently, I was told about this headline, and you can find this on the UN's website, that they have chosen now an initiative called uh, Seven Years of Peace and Security. I just think it's interesting in, in 1 Thessalonians 4 and 5 when God is talking about the rapture of the church, when everybody is saying peace and security, peace and security, then suddenly the return of Christ, and then the seven-year tribulation period, and in the middle of that seven year, they break the treaty, right? And so it's just interesting to me that when we look at this kind of language, CFC, you may say, well, where is God and what is he doing? And I'm saying to you, he might be coming back this week. Powerfully. Revealing himself in the final moment when everybody is saying peace and security. When everybody is saying, oh, where is your God? Where is your God? Ha, ha, ha. And there he comes. The powerful captain of your salvation. And that's why I said in the beginning... If you have not trusted Christ as your personal Savior, now is the time. Stop faltering around. Stop making excuses. And say, God, you have revealed yourself. Prophecies have been fulfilled. I'm going to put my faith in you and you alone. You are my refuge. This powerful captain to whom I go to worship. Now, now we're getting deeper into a description of the refuge and what it means to make him my refuge and to worship him. He says, I will sing a new song to you, O God, upon a ten-stringed harp. I will play to you, the one who gives victory to kings and rescues David, his servant, from the cruel sword. Rescue me and deliver me from the hand of foreigners whose mouths speak lies. And whose right hand is a 
right hand of falsehood, right? So he's, he's under duress. People are speaking lies about him. And instead of stepping out from under that and finding his own refuge, he chooses to worship God with a new song. What does that mean? Now, to the, to the Hebrew listening ear, it has, a, it has a special meaning. When I read this, I'm thinking, I guess I can't worship God. I don't know how to write a song. I, I'm not like a creative songwriter. Plus, I don't know where there's a harp. How do I find a harp around here, this 10-string harp? I guess, I guess you and I can't worship God unless we have a harp. But if, if, if you read it in, from the Jewish culture, what this is saying is, I am going to creatively take action steps to renew my worship of God and to choose to follow Him. The ten-stringed harp is a reflection of the Ten Commandments. And I'm going to creatively take action to choose to follow God in His ways. I'm going to do this. I'm going to light incense when I worship, if that helps to re relate to Him. I'm going to create a prayer closet. I'm going to create a sanctuary in my car in the parking lot. I'm going to journal. I'm going to find creative ways to listen to worship music. I'm going to renew this because what happened to Saul is he lost his first love, the romance of a relationship with God. And I'm going to sing to him a new song. I'm going to press in and make him my refuge. Someone came to me recently and said, Bobby, I decided to go off my psych meds because I want to experience the power of the Holy Spirit. And he said, for the last 10 days, God has been revealing himself to me like never before. So if you're on psych meds, go off all your meds. What is he saying? It's talking about what we make our refuge, CFC. Is your spouse your refuge? Is your spouse your Messiah? Is that what you're leaning on? Is your job your refuge? Is stake your refuge? It can be mine. A lot of it. What is, what is your refuge, right? And so it's not bad, CFC, to fast from something and to say, God... I want to experience your spirit. You are my refuge. I don't want to begin to slip into leaning into these things. Some of you in the room today, every night, you drink too much alcohol. And that becomes your refuge, right? There are so many good and perfect gifts that God gives us. But if this becomes my refuge, and over a life span, Saul had made these things his refuge. David failed, failed, failed. But he, when confronted, he confessed his sins, right? And then he would turn back to God and say, God, against you and you alone have I sinned. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me, right? He made him his refuge. He worshiped him. May we make room in our emotions to attach to God in our minds to attach to God. May our journals and our hearts multiply those lines of adoration and worship towards God to make Him our refuge. I want to close with the blessing of what, what He offers. This is a Hebrew blessing where he's, he's saying, he, he closes with, blessed are the people who have made God their refuge. And not all these other things. I want to be blessed. God, I want to find satisfaction. And here's a warrior king crying out for his nation for peace and prosperity. So he says, may our sons in their youth be like plants full grown. God, as we raise our sons in our households, may they be deeply rooted in a relationship with you, God. And they see it in mom and dad, and they say, we want to be rooted deeply in God. And they grow up to be strong warrior kings. May our daughters be like corner pillars cut for a structure of a palace. And so God, 
Help our daughters as they're raised in our homes to be sculpted for strength and beauty. A statuesque image of a powerful vessel in the hands of God, beautiful as a pillar. God, would you allow our daughters to be this? God, would you allow our granaries to be full? Help our businesses to be booming. Even in the midst of economic struggle, help our businesses to thrive and to boom. And our cattle and our sheep, that's our bank account. Those are our investments. Help them to thrive. Help that stock to just explode. Would you bless us, God? Would you prevent there from being mishaps of failure, God? Would you help my car to just keep running? Help my washer and dryer to keep working? All the things that I have, help them not all to break down, but would you just put your hand of blessing over my possessions, God? And God, would you allow there to be no cry of distress? Help there to be a beautiful justice system in our country to hear the outcry of the oppressed. Would you do this, God? Blessed are the people to whom such blessings fall. Just think about it. And what a blessed people we are when God is our God. Blessed are the people whose God is the Lord. You've made him your refuge. And so like David, you can look Goliath in the eye and you can say, you come at me with a sword and a javelin. I come to you in the name of the living God. He is the captain of my salvation. He is with me. He is my refuge. He is the one to whom I go. He is my fortress. I come to him and I worship you, God. I'm going to sing a new song to you because of who you are. Let's pray together, huh? Why don't we bow in prayer? Lord, we want to thank you today that you are our warrior king, the captain of our salvation. Thank you that you are the one we can run to and find refuge. And God, I just pray in this moment that you would guide our thoughts as we think about taking refuge. I pray right now that if there's someone in the room who feels like they're taking refuge in, in other things and haven't been t- taken refuge in you, that they would be able to name those things. And so just in, in the, this quiet moment, CFC, if you would take a moment to say, God, is there something else I'm, that has become my go-to and I've become numb to you? I've become numb to you. I've lost that sense of you being my first love. And then name it and repent of it right now. Name that false refuge and repent of it right now. Just take a moment to pray quietly and talk to God about that. Lord, I just want to pray for, for us to take refuge in you, God. And I pray for those who have come in the room today, maybe there's fear or disappointment or discouragement, and that our faith would arise in the room and that we would believe you are the captain of my salvation. You are perfecting what concerns me. I will run to you. And Lord, would you complete this message in our hearts? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
May our sons in their youth be like plants full grown, our daughters like corner pillars cut for the structure of a palace. May our granaries be full, providing all kinds of produce. May our sheep bring forth thousands and ten thousands in our fields. May our cattle be heavy with young, suffering no mishap or failure in bearing. May there be no cry of distress in our streets. Blessed are the people to whom such blessings fall. Blessed are the people whose God is the Lord. Thank mm-hmm. you.